uh, in 2005 that addresses the high cost of drugs. Um, for decades, the state has been negotiating at pharma's table on pharma's terms. With this initiative, pharma will have to come to the state's table and negotiate on the state's terms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll just note we're close to seven minutes already, so just Sorry so you guys that. know, okay? All right. Okay. Please go Can ahead. Can we get like a little yellow warning light so we know? I don't see anything here. Well, and I, I don't want to be There's rude. five of you. There's 20 minutes, so I was hoping you would that's that was what we okay. laid out Usually so there's a little okay. uh, I, I, right. I had no idea how long Can anybody plans to speak so how, okay. you, you tell me how much time you want and we'll, we'll wave something five, at you. so just wave a flag or something wave that a flag help. okay right. <laughs> good. okay we'll find a flag we'll look for a good, flag okay good afternoon my name is deborah Berger, and i'm uh president of the ninety thousand plus nurses of the california nurses association and i'm actually on this panel to give a human face to um the patients that we care for every every single day that are suffering because they can't afford the medications they need uh, to live a healthy life. I am here today to speak in favor of the California Drug Relief Price Relief Act, which is qualified for the November 2016 California ballot. The initiative is supported by a wide array of leaders as well as, as well, including but not limited to Senator Bernie Sanders, whom the California Nurses Association, National Nurses United, has in, in, enthusiastically endorsed for the President of the United States. Bernie Sanders today backed the California Price uh, Relief Act, which will save taxpayers from being ripped off by the pharmaceutical companies that charge Americans the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. He said, while Congress has failed to stand up to the greed of the pharmaceutical industry, the people of California can, by supporting this ballot initiative. Senator Sanders knows, just like nurses do, that you don't, can't have meaningful health care reform without meaningful drug price reform. Registered nurses are the lifeblood of the California's health care system. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, nurses answer that call to comfort the sick and to heal the infirm. If we had a penny for every single patient that has told us they can't afford to take their drugs on a daily basis, we would all in this room have a more than robust retirement plan. It is obscene that we are making money off the backs of the needy and the infirm in this country. As a part of this process, we have noticed an alarming trend, which uh, is that many patients are delaying or putting off altogether the necessary care because of the exorbitant prices being charged by insurers, hospital systems, and in particular, pharmaceutical companies. Prices in all areas of the system are increasing at a rapid and alarming rate, but drug prices in particular are especially out of control, increasing at a rate of virtual geometric progression. Patients are being forced to choose between needed care and medications, or in, medi in many instances, no treatment at all. That's why we are so outraged that drug prices have increased so drastically at the expense of patient care. Just the week before last, the New York Times reported, drug makers have raised prices on brand name drugs by double digit percentages since the start of the year, according to two major drug benefit managers. In April alone, Johnson & Johnson raised its prices on several top-selling products, including the leukemia drug Imbrovica and the diabetes treatment in Vocana and Xarelto, uh, an anti-clotting drug. While virtually all drug prices are out of control, spending on specialty medications, such as those used to treat HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, and cancers are rising faster than any other medications. In 2014 alone, total spending on specialty medications increased by 25%. More than 3 million people in the United States are infected with HIV, uh, with hepatitis, a virus that destroys the liver and can cause liver cancer. Um, so what I need to have the legislature in California know is that the California Nurses Association highly supports 
uh, this Drug Relief Act, and we believe that the legislators here in California should do the right thing and actually stand behind this initiative as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and good <coughs> excuse me. Hello and good afternoon. My name is David Fitzpatrick, and I am the supply chain manager for the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm responsible for purchasing, logistics, and inventory management primarily for the pharmacy division of the organization. Uh, prior to joining the AHF team in 2011, I worked the same role for Avella Specialty Pharmacy uh, for nine years. Um, based on my long experience in procurement, I am intimately familiar with the purchasing of drugs and medications and the prices that drug companies charge. In my early days working in specialty pharmacy, I observed annual price increases primarily on branded medications that would range from 5 to 9 percent each year. While price increases for various commodity and services are relatively standard in many industries, I was never able to track down any legitimate reasoning uh, or cost fa factors behind these price increases. These regular annual price increases, which would usually apply for many of the manufacturer's product lines, were far greater than either the rates of inflation or cost of living. Since it was not always predictable as to when exactly the price increases would occur, I did not speculatively buy the product in anticipation for an increase. However, there are a handful of drug wholesalers that have mastered the spec buy industry. There would not be profit in spec buy unless the product had has a significant increase in value that surpasses inflation and the cost of living. Inflation of drug prices is really just another attempt by the wealthy connected influential to manipulate markets, earn huge personal gains, and boost shareholder values of the companies they control. Lately, the prices of even generic drugs are on the rise. Historically, once branded drugs lost patent ex exclusivity, and eventually multi-source, the cost would greatly reduce, but that's trickling away. So what exactly is the basis for these huge cost increases? Is it the manufacturing costs, as drug companies often proclaim? Drug manufacturers have maximized production costs by producing their products overseas in business-friendly countries uh, outside of the U.S. No different than many other commodities, however, the drug prices increase twofold annually. At the bulk manufacturing level, production costs are based on the mixing of bulk chemicals. Bulk chemicals that are honestly dirt cheap to produce, mix and combine in a tablet or other do dosage forms, would not see costs increase this high. The mixing of bulk chemicals into dispensable prescription drug products is not limited to these drug companies. Compounding pharmacies have used this very principle for years. Uh, compounding involves a mixing of active pharmaceutical <laughs> ingredients, or API, into dispensable forms at the pharmacy. The API powder chemicals are distributed by a very uh, variety of repackagers for a mere fraction of the cost of their commercially available drug products. Since we have an idea of what the wholesale acquisition costs are, it's relatively simple to plot where the manufacturer, manufacturing costs might be in relative terms. A great example of this is seen with the compound, recent compounding of pyrimethamine. Pyrimethamine 25 milligram tablets are commercially available as Daraprim. This is the same quite old drug that was recently in the news, uh, and it's a critical drug to control infection in, amongst others, pregnant women and HIV patients. A year ago, the wholesale acquisition cost of Daraprim was just $13 per dosage tablet. However, last year, Turing Pharmaceuticals and their now infamous CEO purchased the rights to the drug and raised the WAC price to $750 per tablet. Here we have a melting pot of Wall Street and pharma earning huge profits on the back of the health care providers, patients, government health programs, and ultimately the entire health care system. In response to the outrageous price increase of Daraprim, a few compounding pharmacies started offering pyrimethamine in alternative doses, strengths, forms, and combinations for less than the $13, original $13 per dose. If a compounding pharmacy in the United States can purchase raw chemical powder and provide $750 therapy for less than 13, where exactly is the justification for the over, overnight price increase? On what is this based? Manufacturing costs? No. The research and development cost? No. Turing bought the rights to the drug and never spent a penny on R&D or invent, invent, inventing. 
The AIDS Healthcare Foundation operates healthcare centers that are Ryan White grant recipients, thus allowing access to discounted 340B pricing on drugs. These prices are close to the federal VA pricing. Currently, we are able to obtain branded Daraprim for a penny a dose under 340B pricing for eligible patients. Yes, that's correct, one penny per dose. Not $13 and not 750 The ultimate cost the Turing price gouging bought about, sorry. Once again, we're <laughs> if a particular drug can be sold for profit at 10 cents per dose, it tells you volume, volumes about the true profit margin on a wide range of drugs that are being priced out of reach for many patients. Where all this is going and what has happened, patients and healthcare programs in the United States cannot afford these drugs. So we are basically starting to outsource healthcare to other countries. If drug manufacturers are only concerned with squeezing out as much profitability of the drug formulations to inflate shareholder value before losing patent exclusivity, where does this leave the patients and healthcare providers? This is simply not a sustainable healthcare model. The California Drug Price Relief Act is not a solution to every problem we face with the outrageous and arbitrary high cost of medications, but it will bring to bear the purchasing power of the state of California on behalf of consumers and taxpayers and can save billions of dollars. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thanks. We've got about three minutes left. So. Um, my name is Michael Wolfeiler. Um, I'm a physician. I'm chief of medicine for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, currently, domestically, we're taking care of um, almost 30,000 uh, patients with um, HIV. Um, the high cost of antiretrovirals to uh, use to treat HIV have been an issue ever since I first started seeing HIV patients in 1987. That was the year also that the very first antiretroviral um, AZT, known by the brand name Retrovir, was approved uh, by the FDA. And there was an uh, opinion piece published by the New York Times back in 1989 that stated AZT is the only drug approved for use against AIDS. It's now known that AZT also postpones the onset of AIDS in people infected with the virus, yet there's a massive obstacle to wider use of this life-saving drug. It's extraordinary cost. At $8,000 a year for users, AZT is said to be the most expensive prescription drug in history. Um, the article went on also to note that AZT had been a drug that had been sitting on the shelf at Burroughs Welcome. It had been developed through federally funded programs at, in Michigan and um, uh, then through the National Institutes of Health. But once um, uh, Burroughs Welcome became aware that there was a benefit in the area of HIV, they quickly got a patent on that drug and uh, protected themselves from anybody else uh, providing uh, competition. Uh, manufacturing the, the same drug um, and uh, maintain this very high price. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me that in 30 years, nothing has changed. We're still going through uh, pricing of drugs at this, these exorbitant levels that make treatment inaccessible to large numbers of, of patients and threaten to bankrupt payers. Uh, drug companies often uh, use the vague rubric of drug development costs to do, justify their pricing, but the truth is that actual costs are, are really essentially a black hole from which the light of disclosure and public accountability never escapes. Um, the, what we're dealing, one of the biggest issues we're dealing with now is with hepatitis C. It's been discussed multiple times during this hearing, and, you know, Gilead, on one hand, should be given credit for developing an amazing drug. I mean, they've taken a drug, uh, they've made a drug that can actually cure hepatitis C in as little as 8 to 12 weeks of treatment, but then they've placed, uh, priced this drug at a, at a level that makes it inaccessible to many patients of $1,000 a pill. Um, what we're now forced to do, and I fight all the time to get Harvoni approved for patients, and many of the payers now have restricted Harvoni to um, only patients who have uh, a certain degree of damage to their livers, uh, a fibrosis level of, of uh, three or four. So we're now placed in a position of having a drug where we could cure somebody, okay, and having to make them wait and continue to have damage to their liver before we're able to actually put them on this medication. It makes no medical sense. 
what other infection do you just allow to progress and damage, hurt the patient, and possibly infect others because of this kind of issue? Okay. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. We've now gone past our time for the proponents, and I, I did lay it out pretty clearly. So uh, we are going to move on to questions uh, from our members here. Does anybody have questions for the panel? I understand the time restriction, so could I just give you just two seconds of my bio because I think it would impact your question and answer section. I, I'm going to give the exact same amount of time to the to the opponents as well. Then, so you, I'll give you a minute and okay, that's we'll perfect. Be at no. 22 plus for the opponents. No, thank you very much for your indulgence. Um, good afternoon. I'm David Poole. I'm director of legislative affairs for the Southern Bureau of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. The reason I asked for that was so that I could also disclose to you I spent nine years with Gilead Sciences. I was director over the National Program for Managed Markets and Government Affairs, and then also spent 12 years with the state of Florida managing a public assistance program for about 100,000 people uh, under the Ryan White uh, federal law. So I just think that perspective is unique, and I wanted to make you aware of that for your Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, I, and I'm not trying to be hard on this, but we, we've given everybody the time frames that we've asked for all along the way from every panel for their their testimony today so i i appreciate everybody everybody's desire to get all this out but but in the interest we we will be going past our four o'clock time now just because of the nature of the of the questions that we've been ha asking and, and getting answers from so so i appreciate i appreciate your efforts and I, I i do i want to be fair to everyone uh and try to try to maintain the schedule as everybody on this dais has other other obligations later today as well so at this point are there questions from members mr thurman Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Ms. Berger, I wanted to ask you a question in your testimony when you talked about the human face and you talked about your members who uh, hear directly from patients. And if you could just say a little bit more to put some context on this. Um, yeah, I wanted to understand are, are, are the majority of those uh, members serving patients who are being supported by Medi-Cal or are these, are these patients who are um, in, in sort of every aspect of the healthcare environment that you would say where they're hearing the complaints about not being able to afford their medication? Okay. Uh, we represent nurses uh, both uh, at city, county level. Uh, we also have nurses here in the room. If you're here and you've heard patients talk about how they can't afford to take prescription drugs, raise your hand. And um, as I said, it isn't hyperbole when I say that if we had a penny for every time a patient said they couldn't take the drug and are in the emergency room because their condition is worse, we would be in retirement now with a very healthy plan. Uh, it isn't a joke. And it is heartbreaking to see patients coming into the hospital with their conditions worse, be, worsening because they couldn't take the um, the medications that were ordered. They had prescriptions that they couldn't fill. Thank Thanks. You. And, and I asked the question because I want the lens that I look through to always be, you know, helping people and, um, and if there are people who are struggling. And sometimes I know I need context. I, you know, I talk about seniors all the time and my concern when I hear about seniors who I know are struggling to balance, say, if they're uh, getting SSI and they're trying to balance food and rent and medication but we don't always get the stories to be really specific and, and and precise and it's really helpful for me to have that context to know and so i was trying to differentiate if you were saying that your members were mostly seeing people in that space who who were being supported by medical or in public public settings uh, but it sounds like you're saying both public and private settings is where your members are hearing this in all walks of life and in all settings however this bill just addresses uh, the state of California it would be nice if it went further I understand that there has to be um, a, a, a stepping stone um, but as we're here debating about stepping stones we have thousands of patients that are dying because they can't afford the drugs I have one patient that I personally dealt with that lost his uh, coverage and couldn't afford the $10,000 $10, a bag chemo treatment, and um, he died. So. Sorry about the patient, but thank you for adding the, the context. Mr. Chu. 
We've heard from the messages from the pharmaceutical industry a number of objections to this bill, the fact that or the possibility that it may not be workable due to the challenges of finding VA prices, that it could actually result in higher drug prices and actually chill medical research in our state. I was wondering if you could, uh, one or someone could, could help address the, the major arguments that we've heard against your measure. And so much of the, the research is actually done through federal funding. Um, uh, you look at a lot of the uh, HIV drugs, you look at AZT again, that was, uh, that was developed through federal funding. It is true that the pharmaceutical companies have to do the clinical trials um, that show efficacy in uh, patients, but that's often different than drug development, um, uh, which is often funded by taxpayers. Could I add something to that, too? Um, in the example of my former employer, too, there was a, the company that was purchased called Pharmacet two years ago, or I think it may have been more like three years ago. Uh, the purchase was $11.2 billion for a portfolio that was already mature. Um, the R&D required to take those drugs to market, the ones that we've discussed numerous times already by the prior panelists, uh, was not R&D. That was merger and acquisition costs. So I'd like to point out that when pharma and bio argue that the price of drugs are tied directly to R&D, I would say that that is a, a, a prime example of it wasn't R&D, it was merger and acquisition. And then we're also talking billions of dollars, especially around those particular products that have put this out to direct to consumer uh, advertising on the television. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We're going to move on to our next panel. So we'll uh, kind of keep you aware of the time, and, and we will uh, give you exactly the same amount of time. And we've got a clock here, so we can we can do that. So, um, so please, uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Grosby. I'm a pharmaceutical consultant, and former chief of pharmacy policy with the Medi-Cal program. In my capacity as the chief of pharmacy policy, I was one of the individuals, or one of the primary individuals, that held manufacturers' feet to the fire when negotiating for supplemental re supplemental rebates. Excuse me. I've been asked to provide my analysis of this initiative that restricts state agency contracting. After studying the initiative, I came to three basic conclusions, and it's been said multiple times here. One, the it, it's almost impossible or very difficult at best for the state to implement this program because of the lack of VA pricing. Uh, it's unlikely that state will save significant amount of money on this initiative and conversely the initiative could increase costs in a variety of state agencies. And three, the initiative could negatively impact patients by either restricting access to drugs or requiring, in the case of Medi-Cal program, individuals to get prior authorization whenever they get a product. The primary point the voters have to understand with this initiative is that it doesn't regulate drug prices. The initiative only prohibits the state from signing a contract with the manufacturer if, the v if it doesn't reach the VA price. It does not prohibit the state from purchasing a drug that is greater than the VA price in the absence of a contract. Because of this contracting prohibit, prohibition, the initiative effectively invalidates current contracts under which the state gets significant discounts and rebates when those contracts do not reach the VA level. The initiative does have one, man, one exclusion, and it was previously mentioned, is managed care in Medicaid. Um, I could not uh, understand the logic behind the inclusion of Medicaid managed care, but the the exclusion of Medicaid managed care, but the inclusion of CalPERS managed care. Uh, and so that was unclear to me. My understanding is the proponents have provided two possible explanations. The first being that it would be too difficult to calculate the net cost uh, under a pharmacy bundle arrangement, capitation arrangement in managed care. 
The second is that as the net cost of drugs in the fee-for-service program decreases, the capitation rate in the managed care program decreases. I don't know if the latter is accurate or true. You'd have to, con you'd have to discuss that with the Department of Health Care Services on how they capitate. But as for the former reason, the net cost of every managed care pharmacy claim can be calculated. Managed care plans are required to submit all pharmacy claim data to the state in order to collect uh, federal rebates. So in much the way the state calculates net costs in the fee-for-service program, they could do so in the Medicaid managed care program. As for impact on state programs, I'm going to just address quickly two programs in a, in, because of the time limit. The first is the Medi-Cal program. The initiative would restrict the Department of Health Care Services from executing contracts when the price would be greater than the VA. Based on my experience in negotiating contracts, manufacturers who are not already providing this level of rebate to the VA price, either through the mandatory federal rebate or through a combination of mandatory federal rebate and supplemental rebate, are likely to do so in the future. As noted by Senator Monning, the state can't compel manufacturers to enter into agreements and manufacturers may have little economic incentive to extend the VA pricing on a particular drug, especially if the bulk of their sales is in the excluded Medicaid managed care program. The resulting cancellation of any existing supplemental rebates places in jeopardy the current program, which is approximately $100 million of general fund. Now, we don't know how much of that might be at, je at, at jeopardy. It could be zero. It could be $100 million. We just don't know because, as previously noted, we don't know what the VA prices are and we don't know how they compare to the Medi-Cal net cost. For those uh, contracts that are canceled and for new drugs for which a contract is never executed, it's clear that the state will be paying a higher rate. Uh, but as Dr. I think it was Dr. Ridley noted, federal law requires the Medi-Cal program to cover virtually all FDA approved drugs and what the law actually says is they have to cover drugs of manufacturers that have executed a federal rebate contract. And to somebody else's question, it was OBRA 90. <laughs> I can't remember who asked that question. It was OBRA 90 and OBRA stands for Omnibus, Omnibus Reconciliation Act, which is the federal uh, budgeting process. So. Without contracts, without current level contracts, the state will end up uh, purchasing drugs because they have to at rates higher than they would have if they were able to execute a contract somewhere above the VA price. Another issue in the validation of these contracts would be that products would be moved to a status of prior authorization. This means that patients would either um, experience a delay in obtaining the, the needed med medication, or they may be forced to go through one or more lower-cost products before they were able to get the product the physician initially wanted them to get. It's also important to note, and I, it may have been mentioned earlier, that there are several classes of drugs, including HIV-AIDS drugs, antipsychotic drugs, and antihemophilia products that are carved out of managed care. That means that for those classes of products, Every person in Medicaid, Medi-Cal, whether they be fee-for-service or managed care, would be impacted by the initiative. As for CalPERS, uh, it's really not clear how, and I don't know if CalPERS themselves know how they would implement the program. Because the ultimate payer is not a state agency, it is likely that the requirement will not apply to the local governments or local school districts managed by CalPERS. It's also unclear how the initiative would apply to CalPERS' two most popular HMOs, Kaiser and Blue Shield, who represent a uh, little over 837,000 CalPERS covered lives and, and who also negotiate their own drug contracts and provide medical and pharmacy benefits under a single capitation rate. Uh, the initiative could disrupt the CalPERS Pharmacy Benefit Management Program, the PBM program, uh, and possibly jeopardize existing uh, ne negotiated rebates that their PBM 
has with manufacturers. In the CalPERS, the current PBM contract, which is with CVS Health, uh, they pass through 100% of the rebates negotiated. I know earlier someone mentioned that in some instances PBMs are holding back some of the money. In the case of CalPERS, 100% of the rebates are passed through to, to the CalPERS per, uh, entity. These rebates would be jeopard potentially jeopardized if the net cost did not get to the VA level. Lastly, the initiative uh, could increase drug prices and lead to health premium increases. Uh, because the initiative may not apply to all CalPERS constituents and plans, it's possible that drug manufacturers could try to recoup lost revenue by increasing drug prices uh, on the non-covered CalPERS by, you know, limiting the, the discounts there. So, again, uh, difficult to implement because of lack of VA pricing. Probably not a, a large savings opportunity and there could be negative impacts on access to drugs.